Hello, Delaware County Alliance. This is our final video, kind of, as we're going through all these, what we've been calling structural relationships. And we're just hoping that these are tools that can help you as you read your Bible, as you are looking at it and asking, what is God saying to me? Or what does this passage have for me? Uh, so we're hoping these videos really serve you. So Jordan, tell us the illustration we've been using. Yeah, so we've been using this illustration of the breadcrumbs, uh, the idea, you know, Hansel and Gretel, they're walking through the forest, and the way they want to find their way back is they're leaving breadcrumbs. Well, uh, the authors of the different books of the Bible, through some sort of amalgamation of human and divine wisdom and inspiration, they did the same kind of thing. They really wanted people to understand how God was revealing himself in their time in the best way that they could. And so they've left behind all kinds of clues and storytelling ideas and all kinds of neat things that we can point to and look at and begin to have a fuller picture of what it means to understand what they meant and to understand what they were intending for us to learn. Yeah, and these patterns, we not only see them, like we see them everywhere in our everyday conversation, and we also see them in scripture. Now, the one we're looking at today, it's called inclusio. I don't, I don't think I had ever heard this word before, before this, but we'll, for our purposes, we'll call it the sandwich yeah. because it's the repetition of like specific words or phrases at the beginning and the end of like a segment. I guess I should go beginning and end. It depends on if you're reading, but if you're reading or talking. Yeah. <laughs> if you hold your sandwich this way, it'll fall apart. Yeah. It's a, but it creates a sandwich, like the bracketing effect. And so, like, when you see this, when you see the repetition of the same words at the beginning and the end, you can ask, like, well, how do these words inform, like, how we understand the segment in between? Or, like, why is the author concerned with this idea? Like, why is he repeating it in the first place? Yeah. Um, but do we see this in, like, everyday culture? Like, where do you see this, Jordan? Yeah, I think for a word that we definitely use, almost, almost certainly the least of any of the words that we've tried to play around with, this is probably one of the storytelling techniques that's also one of the most technical. And so honestly, like even as we're talking about it in this video, don't be discouraged if it doesn't make a ton of sense. But I do think you'll understand it once you start to see it in stories all the time or just in the world around us, right? So like one example, every 10 years we do a census in America and it is supposed to have a beginning and an end to kind of like a decade of life. We're kind of doing something that will inform us of what happened in the middle. Uh, we use one census to go into the 10 year gap and then we use another one to see what happened and then we go into the next one. And it's kind of this sandwich between the years that the United States uses to help understand everything that happened in between. Uh, from a storytelling perspective, a great example is the movie Toy Story, which Steven, you love the movie Toy Story, I know. I love all things Pixar. Yeah. Do you want to explain where we see this in Toy Story? Well, yeah. You were just talking about how the movie opens up with Andy's birthday and all the toys are freaking out because he's going to get new toys. And then the movie follows this huge journey because of the new toy Andy got, Buzz Lightyear. And how does the movie end? It ends on Christmas Day, another day where they're getting more toys. They're all freaking out. Mr. Potato Head gets a Mrs. Potato Head. The pig goes, way to go, Idaho. <laughs> But it's like, it, it basically, it frames this whole story in Andy gaining toys. And it almost like, it leaves you wondering, well, what's going to happen in the next uh, kind of saga of, their, yeah. the, of the story? Yeah, what's important to understand too about Inclusio is sometimes in scripture, it'll be the exact same word or phrase that bridges it. Sometimes it will be like the same idea or maybe a little bit different, which can make it kind of complicated and confusing, admittedly. Um, but there are parts of scripture that are bracketed by two specific stories or ideas, and somehow they're similar enough that everything in between starts to make sense when you look at these two verses or ideas or these stories and, and use them as lenses, really, to look at everything that happened in the middle. Yeah. Uh, it just gives you an opportunity to see things a little bit differently. Well, and adver advertising understands the power of this. When you watch a movie at the beginning, you'll see like the Disney logo with the castle. And what do they do at the end of the movie with the script? You see the castle again. They're like saying, they're basically like stamping their identity on this story. So if you like the story, 
we're going to remind you at the beginning that we made this story. We're going to remind you at the end. And I think the authors do this. Well, let's look at an example. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about Matthew. If you read through the book of Matthew, at the beginning, one of the names that's given to Jesus in the very opening chapters is Emmanuel. It's a name that often comes up around Christmas time. What does that mean? God with us. So we have this idea of God with us. Fast forward to the end of the book where we have the Great Commission. Um, Jesus is like saying, go out, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And at the end, he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You have this idea of God with us that's bookending or sandwiching the whole gospel. And it's, you can almost read it, when you read it through that lens, it's like Jesus' whole life ministry was meant to tell us that as we walk out this life, God is with us. Like that, that's a powerful idea. And that's what he was, that's like, you could sum up Jesus's ministry in that way, in a sense. Everything we understand Jesus did was for him to understand that he is with us. Yeah. Where, where is this minister to you, Jordan? Yeah. I love that example because it's an example of not literally the same, but the ideas being things that bookend. Yep. My example is one that's a little bit complicated, but it uses the same words. So in Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 7, there's actually a couple of inclusios that work together as the writer of Hebrews is reinterpreting the time where the Jews were out in the desert in the wilderness. Uh, he's saying, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. These were the words that uh, Joshua spoke to the people. So then he repeats it again in verse, uh, so that's 3, 7, and then in three fourteen, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So he's, there's language in between that that he's reinterpreting for the modern day. And then he says it again in 4, 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And between those three instances, each time he's looking at the, at the exodus and the wilderness experience as a modern day experience for modern day Christians at his time, the first century. But even for us today, the author of Hebrews is using this vocabulary over and over again to talk about this section. And it's so important that he's using the same words over and over again to help us understand. There's a new way to understand this. You need to understand how it applies to you today because the church is often in a wilderness experience uh, when it chooses to harden its heart and move against God's will. Uh, that's what it means to be in the wilderness. So that's just an example that speaks. Your example is instead of a, like a traditional sandwich, it's almost like a Big Mac. You got the it bread <laughs> in the middle. You got a bun in the middle. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, so it, what describe soap to us? We've been using that. So SOAP is just a really simple acronym that we've been using, or I hope it's simple, it's as simple as it makes sense. More letters. Yeah, uh, acronym that hopefully helps you understand, like if I just wanted to spend a little bit of time in scripture every day and grow and get to know God a little bit better, I could walk through these four things. You know, there's so many ideas, so many Bible studies you can do, so many blah, 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 it gets overwhelming. This is something that I think makes sense for me as I even like journal for myself or whatever. So it's scripture. What is the scripture I'm looking at right now? What passage, what verse or whatever? Observations, just very simply writing out or typing like, okay, here's what I'm seeing. Here are very simple logical observations that make sense. Application, then how do those observations fit into my life? Yep. And then prayer how can I lift up what I'm learning up to the Lord and pray for his transformation in this area? So that's so. So we walk through it through every video. Uh, I think the scripture we're going to do today is Psalm 150. Is that right? Yep, Psalm 150. You got to flip there. Let me read it for us. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power and praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals and praise him with resounding cymbals. Let every one thing that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
So there's our scripture and our observation is, I mean, there's a lot happening here, but there's I, definitely I the sandwich. I see the sandwich, Jordan. The I heard sandwich. it. Yeah, the sandwich is there. It's introducing language that we need to understand what this psalm is calling us to. And also through maybe some repetition, I think I yeah. might have repeated the word praise a few times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had the very, like you're saying, sometimes it's a specific word or phrase. Sometimes it's more of an idea. Here we have a specific sentence. Yeah. Praise the Lord, verse one. Praise the Lord, the end of verse six. Yeah. It's like you said, that like, that frames how we understand this whole psalm. It's pretty straightforward in a sense. Yeah. So what are some observations, other observations you see about this, Stephen? Yeah, so we have the observation of, obviously, we see inclusio happening here. We see the inclusio working with the repetition. Like, not only does it say praise the Lord at the beginning and the end, but then it uses the word praise to start every verse after that. So this is definitely a psalm of praise. Yeah. And when you, it's interesting, he lists all these different ways to praise the Lord. And then after he lists all the different ways to praise the Lord, he says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Yeah. So it's like, not only are there almost like an endless number of ways to praise the Lord, there's an endless number of people and beings to praise the Lord. This is yeah. it's all about praise. Yeah, you see in like the first two verses, there's a place where God reside, re, or, uh, resides uh, in his sanctuary. And there are things we're praising him for, which are his acts of power and surpassing greatness. And then how do we respond to that? I think this is interesting when you think about application and observation. But when I hear about a being with unlimited power who uh, is like worthy of praise, I don't always think about playing music. Yeah. Right? Like I don't always think about like, well, I need to go get myself a trumpet and uh, and like go at it. But it really seems like somehow uh, this honors the surpassing greatness of God is for us to worship through some manner of confession of his greatness and also some manner of like music and dancing and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, make some noise. It reminds me of like at a at a sporting event where like a huge play happens and then you have on the big screen like all these flashing lights and yeah. like everyone's yelling and it's like it's 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 almost just saying like this is the the our designed response yeah. like we are to make a noise in some ways and I think you're right I don't always think of music um, but I think they're when we do engage in making a joyful noise unto the Lord I think another psalm talks about that we find that there is something that um it like it, it our spirit like connects with that in a way that I think we're designed to yeah so is that your application? You're going to be, you're just going to be more emotive. More. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put it like the big screen up and like all the flashing lights, like at the, <laughs> just start screaming. Um, well, I mean, on one hand, I, I'm, I'm making a, I'm definitely making a, um, not an inference. Uh, I can't think of what the word is. An assumption. Oh, I'm okay. assuming that a lot of these instruments are kind of bound to their culture. Like some of these, we don't, I don't really see people worshiping with symbols as much anymore. I'm assuming yeah. symbols more than like, I associate symbols with parades now, but you always are, have a timbrel. You're I do. Now I do have a timbrel. That's right. <laughs> um, so I guess, I mean, we're, we're laughing about this. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe tell me what you think of this. Is it, is it appropriate, would it be appropriate to say, like, praise him with your iPhone and headphones, in a sense? I, I mean, I think that's possible. I think, I mean, it's possible with all these instruments, there's probably also a communal element, right? Like, yeah. if you bring, one person cannot play all these instruments at the same time, unless you're one of those, like, crazy one-man band things. Yeah, I, I just imagined good. someone in the woods by themselves <laughs> banging a cymbal. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a communal element, but yeah, I think there is it is kind of communicating that there's like nothing that's really out of bounds depending on your heart, right? Like if the Psalms are associated with David and we know that he 
supposedly like worshiped in adoration in some undignified ways. I remember one time I was at a worship conference and they were doing uh, the cha-cha slide uh, during a worship song and then like another dance. And I remember being like, that's super weird and makes me very uncomfortable. But I'm choosing to believe that they were genuinely worshiping the Lord in that moment and were trying to express it in a way that made sense to them. And so yeah. I don't know. I'm sure there are things that are out of bounds, but I don't, I don't want it to be my job to like figure out what those are. <laughs> well, honestly, it probably just goes back to your heart. If your heart is not out of bounds, maybe the action's not. Yeah. I mean, we, I don't know. No, I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to say, David, David got naked when he was worshiping and the Bible seems to uphold that. Now there's, there's definitely a time and place, but that is an expression of your discipleship that you can honestly say. Anyway, yeah, we could go down a rabbit trail with that. But what's our prayer then if we think this is the application? What's our prayer for disciples of Jesus from this psalm? Well, I mean, you pointed out at the beginning there's a place for worship where also there's like a, an attention. Our attention are on God's acts, on his greatness. And then there's this response. Um, so I think you your prayer is you you kind of find your prayer i mean maybe a little bit of application you find like your prayer closet in a sense your sanctuary and your prayer is you like give thanks to god for his great acts and you just praise him whether that's in song whether that's verbally whether that's just with like yeah. it's silence with outstretched hands um but some i think it's calling it's definitely calling forth some sort of behavior i think so too yeah. So that's, that's inclusio. It's simultaneously maybe one of the more confusing, but I think honestly, the best storytellers incorporate inclusio in their storytelling because they have a point to their story. There's a reason that they're doing the things that they're doing. And they will remind you of that point at the beginning of something and at the end of something. And if they're really trying to like nail it, They'll probably do it. I even think of like, I think public speakers are trained to say their thesis at the beginning. Like, I am here to tell you about this. And at the end, they say, I have now told you about this to the best of my ability. And it's just a way of communication that maybe is less, you know, is more polished than we're used to, but really is a way to help us understand like, okay, this matters. Like, I'm communicating something that matters and I want it to. Uh, be expressed in a way that will affect people well and that's what believe it or not like 2,000 years ago these guys who were writing on like vellum and whatever else they were using to write like had this level of intentionality and they were beautifully crafted storytellers yeah um, I think modern people discount that but it's totally the case the more we study the bible it's just a beautiful tapestry of work any final thoughts, Stephen? Nope. <laughs> I think we're gonna, probably going to do one or two more videos. We're going to pick a passage and do these last half of videos like we did with the prodigal son. And then hopefully I think we'll do one bigger passage and try to just go full force at it, um, really demonstrate our competency because that's what this is all about. No, that's not true. But really just like show all the different odds and ends that you can get from a passage and how it can speak to you today and hopefully in a way that makes sense uh, in storytelling. So we'll catch you guys later.